Welcome as we continue our journey through the book of Esther. And today we're going to conclude our journey as we look at chapters 9 and chapter 10. Chapter 10 is only a couple of verses long, so we're going to do the two of them together. And this is when the victory is sealed and it's all made complete. And uh, it's amazing when you look at this journey. There's so much in it for us to learn about the journey that you and I are on at this point in history. So let's start off with Esther chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar on the thirteenth day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. Which decree was that? That was the first one. Remember there was a first decree that on this day, all the Jews could be annihilated. And that decree could not be rewritten. So Mordecai and Esther say, what can we do? The king says, you write a new decree. So they did write a new decree. And the decree was that the Jewish people could fight for themselves and defend themselves and they could take whatever plunder they wanted. So we continue reading in Esther chapter 9. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. Can you believe that there were still people? This, the, the, the second decree was written in the third month. So for eight months, everybody in the whole empire that stretched from India to Ethiopia would have all been talking. Oh, yeah, they're Jewish people. I'm not going against. I'm not going against the Jewish people. Have you seen? Did you see what happened to Haman? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm a good. Yet there were still enemies of the Jewish people that rose up. There will always be enemies to God's people. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, and the opposite occurred in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. If they hadn't hated them, they wouldn't have been overcome. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. They didn't go after anybody who was dealing peacefully with them, only the people that sought harm for them. And no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials in the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai that fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. And thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with those who hated them. The Jewish people had so many people that hated them. But they had someone great on their side. They actually had the king, the king Ahasuerus and his queen and his prime minister now are all on their side, all the resources of the king. So it didn't matter who was going to war against them. And the Jews defeated all their enemies. You you and I will always have enemies too. And we will have enemies we need to deal with. But who's on your side? Who's on my side? Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So why do we have a reason to fear? Romans 8, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is the kind of resolve we need to have. It was the same resolve of the Jewish people in the story of Esther. And so we move on to verse 6. And in Shushan, the citadel, The Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Remember, they only destroyed those who sought their harm. Also, Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Aradatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aradai, and Vajezatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. They were given permission in the decree. If you kill anybody because they come after you, you can take whatever they own. And they never took one thing. Never took one thing. Yet the decree that Haman said was, we can kill all the Jews and take all their plunder. And that's what everybody planned to do. Verse 11. And on that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel, and the 10 sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? And it shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. And Esther said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. 
and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. And so the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan. But they did not lay a hand on the plunder. And the remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies and killed 75,000 of their enemies. Can you believe there were 75,000 people who still rose up against the Jewish people? Stupid people. Stupid people. But they did not lay a hand on the plunder of those 75,000. They could have taken all their goods. They didn't touch one piece of it. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Uh, a lot of people have criticized Esther for asking for Haman's 10 sons to be hanged, saying, oh, well, it showed a lack of love towards her enemies. But she displays the same principle that's so fa often found in Joshua that she was not going to settle for anything less than total victory. And remember that Jesus had not yet come with a new covenant. He'd not yet preached the Sermon on the Mount, where an eye for an eye was replaced by turn the other cheek. That had not happened yet. So they hanged Haman's ten sons. Now you have to remember who Haman was. Haman and his sons were the descendants of the Amalekites. They were... Uh, the sworn enemies of the Jewish people. First Samuel 15, you can read about them. God had actually commanded Saul, the son of Kish, to execute the full extent of God's judgment against the Amalekites in First Samuel 15. And Saul didn't do it. Because Saul, who was God's anointed, did not do what God told him to do, we actually ended up having the whole story of Esther in the first place. So now we have a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin. Because originally it was Saul who was the son of Kish. He was meant to destroy the Amalekites. Now it's somebody from the tribe of Benjamin and a son of Kish called Mordecai who was going to complete God's judgment. Same group. God says, hey, I asked your forefathers to do something. They didn't do it. I'm now asking you to do it. It was God's intent that at last, Spurgeon said this, at last conflict should take place between Israel and the Amalekites. The conflict which began with Joshua in the desert was to be finished by Mordecai in the king's palace. It's exactly what God intended and asked Saul to do. God's eternal purposes will always be completed. Why? Because Isaiah said in Isaiah 46, verse 10, that God declares the end from the beginning. He declares it. He's declared it to be so. And at this point in history, he had declared it that the Amalekites should be destroyed because they were God's. They, now, why? Because they had come up as enemies against God's people. Had they not done that, God wouldn't have said it. So then we have the establishment of a feast in memory of all of this that still goes on to this day. This is the establishment of the Feast of Purim. Esther 9, verse 18. But the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th and on the 15th of the month they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled towns celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them, and from mourning to a holiday. 
that they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. And so the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun, and Mordecai had written to them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them, and had cast pure, P-U-R, that is, the lot, to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, can you see this is a summation of the whole story. When Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. And so they called these days Purim, after the name Pure. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning the matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them, that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year, according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city, that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. God had a plan for this to be remembered to this day for the Jewish people. Remember, If I'm for you, who can be against you? Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the Mordecai, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the uh, kingdom of Ahasuerus, with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them and as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting. And so the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim and it was written in the book. The principle of remembering what God has done, which was good for you and for me, is something that was established in the story of Esther. And I think too often we forget what God has done in our lives. Do you know Purim is one of the most popular Jewish feasts to this day? They have costumes, they have games, they have songs. It's usually celebrated Purim somewhere between uh, the end of February and the middle of March, depending on the moon and the rise and fall of it. And I I think sometimes, you know, like we're not commanded in the Bible to to have feasts to remember what God has done, but I don't think it would be a bad idea if you and I every now and then just had a meal together with our family to, to say thank you and to remember what God has done instead of just being concerned with our current prayer requests and in the middle of the horrible things that we're in. The Jewish people have an amazing resilience to be able to celebrate feasts like this to this day in Israel when bombs are being rained down on them and they will just stop and they say, no, we're going to take time. We were told to remember. We're going to remember. We're going to do it with gladness and hope. And as we move on to chapter 10, which is only a couple of verses long, let me read it to you so that we can actually look and see what we observe from this whole book. And King Ahasuerus imposed tribute taxes on the land and on the islands of the sea. And now all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. The book of Esther shows how the hand of God will continually move in a supernatural way for God's eternal purposes and plans to be established. Spurgeon said this, It has been well said that the book of Esther is a record of wonders without a miracle, and therefore, though equally revealing the glory of the Lord, It sets forth in another fashion from that which is displayed in the overthrow of Pharaoh by miraculous power. So we think about God's arrangement. When you look at the book of Esther, you are reminded that God is arranging things in his eternal plan for his eternal purposes. 
And you and I must just respond in the sliver of time in which we live. God arranged for Queen Vashti to lose her place, and she did it because she was actually trying to protect the king in chapter 1. God arranged for this wonderfully bizarre competition to replace Queen Vashti. God arranged for Esther to enter this competition. God arranged special, special favor for Esther among the 400 women who are part of this competition. God arranged for Mordecai to have access to Esther, to be able to take, she was his cousin. Her mum and dad died. Mordecai takes her in. And then after she goes in, God arranges for him to have a, be, a, a, a way to be able to communicate with her. God arranged that the lot which was cast. Remember when Haman was saying, okay, when are we going to kill the Jews? And he basically rolls the dice and it lands on the 12th month. And this is in the first month of the year. And he just says, okay, that's what it is. So we won't kill them for another 11 months. God arranged that. God arranged the decree that the Jews would be killed by private hands instead of by the army of Persia. They were not going to be killed by the, the king's army. They were going to be killed by a, a private militia paid off by Haman. God arranged that Haman was going to restrain his anger against Mordecai when he wouldn't bow down before him. God arranged for Esther to delay her request when she had the first feast. And he says, no, no, you've got to ask him back for another feast because I've got some work to do in the next 24 hours. God arranged for Haman's anger to come and reach its peak on one particular day, a bad day for him. God arranged for Ahasuerus to have a sleepless night and say, bring me the books of Chronicle. God arranged for Ahasuerus to, to have the book of the Chronicles read to him, which reminded him of the story of Mordecai and how he'd saved his life by an assassination attempt. And God arranged for Ahasuerus to say, oh, what have we done for Mordecai? God's hand in history involves us. We are involved in doing what God wants to do. The actions of Esther and Mordecai were critical to the preservation of the people of God. Our acts are critical to the preservation of the gospel message and sending it forth. God's will will be accomplished. But we are free to do as we please. We can either be obedient or we can be disobedient. Haman did as he pleased. Haman chose the wrong side. Ahasuerus did whatever he wanted to. Mordecai did whatever he wanted to. Esther did whatever she wanted to. There was no interference. There was no coercion. They all did what they willed to do. Mordecai and Esther willed to do the will of God. But God works out his eternal plan. Even through men and women willing to do what God wants them to do or willing to do something different. God has a way of working it all out. Spurgeon said this. There it is. Man is a free agent in what he does, responsible for his actions, and verily guilty when he does wrong. And he will be justly punished too. And if he be lost, the blame will rest with himself alone. But yet there is one who ruleth over all, who without complicity in their sin makes even the actions of wicked men to subserve his holy and righteous purposes. Believe these two truths and you will see them in practical agreement in daily life, though you will not be able to devise a theory for harmonizing them on paper. You'll never be able to work it out. God's ways, the prophet Isaiah said, God's ways are higher than your ways and my ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my thoughts. He doesn't think like we do. His ways aren't about doing things the way we would do them because he, why? Because he always has eternal purposes, eternal plans in mind. We don't think like that. God had a wise plan and it was to allow his people to be tested 
but he was going to protect them. It's the same thing now. He allows us to be tested, but we're always going to be protected. And you, well, why? Why would God test me like this? I just don't understand. As if your statement of, well, I just don't understand, God should say, oh, I'm sorry that you don't understand. Let me change it all. Let's get the angels, uh, let's get a committee meeting together and change it because we can't have you not understanding. Oh my goodness, that's just terrible. No, you see, we have to understand that we are servants of God. And we will go through trials, but we'll be protected from them. 1 John 5, 4. Who is this who overcomes the world, but who has faith in Jesus Christ? You can't go through life without having to overcome trials. You and I are called to be overcomers, but we have to have something to overcome in the first place. The trials are part of God's design. And you might say, well, I don't understand it. I don't like it that that's the way it is. But it was a trial for Mordecai. Mordecai, you think of all the crises of conscience that Mordecai had through this story where he had to decide, do I protect Esther? Do I protect the Jewish people? Do I protect myself? No, he always did what was right in the eyes of God. He refused to bow to Haman. He knew it was the right thing to do, even though it looked like him not bowing to Haman was going to result in the entire Jewish people in the kingdom of Persia being annihilated. That's what it looked like. But he did the right thing. Uh, what's, what's my observation through this whole story? God's hand is on everything and Jesus is in every part of the Bible. God's got his hand on your life. I don't know what you're going through, but God knows. I don't know what trials you're in, in the middle, you're in the middle of right now, but God knows. And I know that Philippians 4, as I say over and over and over again, I've said it in many of these, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the power of your testimony. That's what the Bible says. You will overcome because you have Jesus on your side. You have Jesus in you. You've accepted the free gift of salvation. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So you can't lose. But it doesn't mean you're going to just have an easy ride. And I know some of you are having a tough time right now. So I want to pray for you that you'll remember this story of Esther that no matter where you are in the timeline of your trial, your tribulation, you'll remember that God's will for your life, he's got your back. You might not see it or feel it right now, but he has never left you and he never will because it's a promise of his word. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Never, never, ever, ever. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the story of Esther and I pray, Lord, that Anybody who's watching this right now, listening to this, that God, that they would have a resolve rise up within them, that Lord, that no matter what trial they are going through, that they remember the past victories of what you've done in their life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.